Welcome back, guys. So in the last video, we talked about the Golgi apparatus. We've also previously mentioned lysosomes and the rough ER and the way that the Golgi apparatus is used for sorting. So let's look at a few more examples of sorting. Okay, so how do proteins get sorted? Two new examples. The first, let's go to the lysosome. So what are lysosomes? Lysosomes are small, single membrane digestive organelles. So we've talked about these guys being digestive before. And so you can see, here are some lysosomes. They contribute to the breakdown of things like food that enter the cell through what's called phagocytosis. Okay, they can also digest older organelles like older mitochondria that need to be recycled. Food, again, through the phagocytosis pathway, if we're recycling something, that's usually referred to as autophagy. Okay, so we're able to recycle these organelles. Additionally, it's worth noting that things like macrophages, whose job it is to sort of engulf bacteria, they also can use lysosomal sort of um, compartments to digest bacteria as well. Okay, so a lot of different functions for the lysosome. And again, we've mentioned this in the previous video, it's largely gonna participate in breaking things down through hydrolysis types of reactions. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. Okay, so in order for a lysosome to function, it must contain a type of digestive enzyme called acid hydrolases. So here's our acid hydrolase, okay, it's just a protein. And as you may suspect, these enzymes degrade molecules when they're in acidic conditions. So in order to work, you guys are probably pretty familiar with the idea that enzymes need a particular pH to function. In order to work, these guys have to function at a low pH, okay? Because these proteins are uh, gonna be in our in a membrane system, they are synthesized by a bound ribosome, okay? But we're gonna have targeting carbohydrates that are gonna be added to them as it makes its way from the ER to the Golgi. So we started out with a protein that was translated by a bound ribosome. So yes, it had a signal peptide to begin with. Now we're gonna add another layer on top of that to see how these carbohydrates that are added in the Golgi are gonna help us target it to the lysosome. So let's see how this carbohydrate signal is built. Okay, to get to the lysosome, one of the attached carbohydrates must be a monosaccharide called mannose. So this mannose is gonna form the base of our signal. So just so you can see what it looks like, this is a mannose molecule. No, you don't have to learn how to draw it or memorize anything like that at this point. Okay, so we have a mannose as our base. And eventually, as we pass through the Golgi, a small functional group called a phosphate is added to this mannose. Okay, phosphates are gonna do a lot of things for us in cell biology, but today it's gonna help us build this signal. So if you are familiar with the way that carbons are numbered in organic chemistry, this phosphate is specifically added to the six carbons. So we number them one, two, three, four, five, six, just so that you know where the name came from. This molecule, is therefore called a mannose-6-phosphate. So just to kind of make it brief, the signal that helps us know that this protein needs to get to the lysosome is called mannose-6-phosphate. Okay, so let's see how the signal works. So as this enzyme moves through the Golgi, you can see we have our acid hydrolase here, our mannose, we've just added it, okay? We're able to watch this again, sort of traffic its way through the cisternate, eventually adding the phosphate. Okay, so phosphate added in the Golgi. It continues its way until it's ready to leave the trans phase. So let's zoom in on that. Once the acid hydrolase has its modifications, it is ready to be sorted. So cargo from the Golgi gets packaged into again those small membrane encased compartments, vesicles, which are going to bud from the transphase and carry the contents to the proper place in the cell. 
But how does a vesicle know what it has inside it? How does it know, once it's a bubble of membrane, that what it has inside it needs to go to the lysosome? It has to use receptors. Okay, so protein receptors will be present for this. Here is the nano-6-phosphate receptor. So we're starting out here at the trans face of the Golgi apparatus. And we've got our mano 6 phosphate receptor. And what we're going to see is that the internal part of this receptor is going to match the biochemical shape of this mano 6 phosphate. Okay, so in we go and it will bind. So once this is going to be attached, the acid hydrolase with a mano 6 phosphate is now attached to the mano 6 phosphate receptor. We're ready to bud off from the light, from the vesicle and end up at the lysosome. So leaving the Golgi apparatus in a vesicle. Okay, so making our way to the lysosome, we're now on route. Okay. So let's go to our next destination. Okay, so it isn't really clearly shown in this picture. We just show mature lysosomes, but as we mature into a fully functional lysosome, we kind of go through a phase called the late endosome. So this is like an immature lysosome. Okay, so we're headed basically into the lysosome. Here is, again, an immature lysosome we're looking at called an endosome. So this endosome is collecting enzymes from the Golgi apparatus, so it's getting ready to receive ours, and it's starting to maintain a lower pH interior. So again, those acid hydrolases must have a low pH and acidic pH to function, and this also kind of ties back to the advantages of compartmentalization. Really nice to have that compartment that's going to hold those digestive enzymes. Once all the necessary lysosomal components are present and the pH is optimal, the endosome can function as a mature lysosome. So here comes our acid hydrolase. The vesicle membrane, which was holding our enzyme, will fuse with the membrane of the endosome. Okay, so we'll just fuse, they're both membrane. And once we're inside, the lower pH inside this endosome, it's gonna cause our acid hydrolase to dissociate, to kind of break away from the receptor. So now we can just float freely within this endosome or lysosome, okay? So next, the vesicle, its membrane, it can butt off again and take the receptor back. We can recycle that like a taxi to go and pick up more cargo. There it goes, goodbye. Okay. So now we recycle these back. Okay, so our enzyme is now in our late endosome, early lysosome, and now our receptor has gone back to get more stuff. Okay, so now we are ready to function as a fully formed lysosome. Okay, so that's example one, how do we get to the lysosome? Okay. So the signal peptide that we discussed in the previous video, I want to be really clear. Again, acid hydrolases, the guy we saw in the just previous example, that acid hydrolase going to the lysosome, has a signal peptide. It has to get into the ER. But even though that sounds really general, it's actually, again, very specific. And there are many other types of signals that are directly coded for in the amino acid sequence. So in the lysosome example, the mannose-6-phosphate sequence or the signal is not part of the protein. The protein is made, and then these carbohydrates and phosphate groups are added. In our next example, we're going to look at another sort of time when the signal is directly coded for by the amino acid sequence. So how do protein get sorted? Example two. I like to call this Shawshank, but this is for enzymes that live in the endoplasmic reticulum. So I don't want you guys to get confused. Anything that gets translated into the 
rough ER must have at one point had a signal peptide that we discussed in the last video. We, in this video, discussed that nano 6 phosphate modification that allowed us to go to the lysosome. The second example is a completely separate example. It's a different case for when enzymes actually live in the endoplasmic reticulum. That's where they work and do their job. So let's head back to that rough ER lumen. We've seen this before. And this is an enzyme that's going to live in the ER. Okay, it wants to stay here. This is where it works and lives. Okay, so proteins that need to live in the ER have an amino acid signal on their tail end that we call KDEL. So somewhere on the tail end, we call this the KDEL sequence, and it is so named because these are the abbreviations for the amino acids that make it up. Okay, so lysine, aspartic acid, stomach acid, leucine. Okay, so this is our KDEL sequence, and again, to contrast this with our mannose-6-phosphate signal, this is actually embedded as part of the protein. It's part of the amino acid sequence. Okay, so let's zoom back out and note we've got a lot of these KDEL proteins hanging out in the rough ER, and again, this is where they should live. Packaging proteins into vesicles, as we saw, can use receptors to really carefully regulate and control what gets packaged in vesicles. But there's a lot going on in here. There's a lot of proteins, a lot of different things, and there's also a little bit of diffusion going on. So this means that ER proteins can sometimes accidentally escape or Shawshank, making their way into the cisternae of the Golgi apparatus. So we need some way to be able to retrieve the proteins with the KDEL signal. And how do we detect and capture them? Okay, so if you're wondering how we detect and capture these guys, there they go, Shawshanking. One guy got all the way out here. We need a KDEL receptor. Okay, so let's zoom in. We're now in the Golgi apparatus, so these guys shouldn't be in here. We have KDEL receptors, which have, again, a sort of internal side that are going to be able to bind our KDEL sequence. So there we go. You can see that we bind the KDEL sequence. Here's our KDEL. Okay, but wait, most of the vesicles we saw going from the Golgi are going out to the rest of the cell, not backward to the ER. So how does the vesicle know, and this time, that it's not supposed to go to the lysosome, it's supposed to go to the ER, it's supposed to go backwards, okay? So we haven't gotten into a lot of detail about this, but I'm gonna start adding it in. The way that it knows what's going on internally is signaled to the outside, okay? So these KDEL receptors, once they have their KDEL cargo bound, the cytosolic side is going to tell this vesicle where to go so it can interact with other things out in the cytosol. Okay, and just to give you an example of how this works, a lot of vesicle trafficking is controlled by what are called coat proteins. So these proteins are literally going to coat the outside of this vesicle, and those are going to help give some directionality. Okay. So they're going to interact with the outside of these receptors. Okay, so here are some coat proteins. This particular one we're calling COP1, and these COP1 types of coats help set up this vesicle to move more to the interior of the cell, okay, more toward the ER instead of outward to the plasma membrane. So this particular one is called COP1. There are types of proteins called COP2, which go the other way, but setting yourself up for coat proteins. And again, if you're really interested in vesicle trafficking, we talk a lot about this coat proteins in advanced cell. Okay, so now we're still in the Golgi apparatus. This vesicle is gonna go ahead. We don't need those coat protein, proteins anymore. And it's gonna go ahead and go back to the ER. So here's the rough ER, now on the receiving end. Okay, again, that vesicle membrane merges with the compartment in the rough ER. Okay, and now these KDEL proteins can go back into the cell, 
and be welcomed with their friends, okay? Again, they were supposed to stay here the whole time. These receptors can then go back to the Golgi apparatus in another vesicle and get ready to capture more of these KL sequencers. So let's look at this, again, kind of on the whole, okay? So we can see here are some secretory proteins. These are supposed to leave. Here they go, ER, sort of the cis-ish face of the Golgi, sort of getting there, eventually leaving the trans phase to be secreted. And here are these KL proteins, okay? And again, they're supposed to live in the ER, but here they go, they accidentally get sort of distributed out throughout the Golgi. They're gonna be captured, this COP1 coat interacts on the outside of these forming vesicles, telling us to move backwards in this retrieval pathway towards the ER. Okay, so again, that's COP1. I mentioned COP2 previously. That's gonna help us move forward in this pathway so that we can move outwards towards the plasma membrane. So in conclusion, we learned about two additional sorting signals. So they're separate things, they shouldn't be confused, okay? So you can't be a, an enzyme that is supposed to live in both the ER and in the lysosome. You have to pick one. The mannose 6-phosphate signal says, take me to the lysosome, and it's a carbohydrate with a phosphate on it. It's not part of the amino acid sequence. We also looked at these KDL proteins, again, separate example, where the KDL sequence is part of the amino acid sequence. It's an inherent part of that protein. And that helps tell these proteins that they need to live in the actual ER. Okay. The MATO 6 phosphate signal again directs us to the lysosome, it's our digestive organelle, and the KDL sequence, which you can use in the ER. So both of these signals happen in addition to that signal peptide. Because without the signal peptide, you can never enter the rough ER to begin with. So you've got to have that to start, and then you can start to layer some of these other things on top. In our next video, we'll be looking at an additional example of what can go on in the endomembrane system that's a little bit relevant to biology today.